Hello and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paquo. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all around the world. Now, we should all be able to agree that the Catholic education and faith formation of children really begins in the home with the parents. This is key. Vatican II is clear on it. It's just good sense. But beyond that, a child, if not homeschooled, will spend an average of 35 hours a week or even more under the tutelage of other teachers than their parents. And that makes the Catholic education and faith formation of those who are instructing their children extremely important. Our guest tonight is the president and executive director of the Evangelium Institute, which provides dynamic catechesis to Catholic school teachers in order to equip their students in the knowledge and the practice of the Catholic faith. Here to tell us more about it is our guest, Deacon Omar Gutierrez. Deacon, welcome. Thank you, Father. Very good to be here. Good to have you here. Thank good you. to have you here. Um, what got you into this kind of work? Well, uh, a product of Catholic education myself, yes. happily. Uh, I um, was working in the Archdiocese of Omaha, uh, working with the Archbishop there, Archbishop Lucas, mm -hmm. and he had wanted to, uh, in response to requests from parents, to advance this effort to try to be intentional about forming Catholic school teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, this was an initiative that he's helped start a number of years ago, and so um, I was asked to start working with these teachers, and. Um, it has been some of the most fruitful work I've ever done in the 20 plus years I've been working for the church. Mm -hmm. uh, and working with them and bringing them uh, more knowledge about the faith so they can pass it on to their students. This is an uh, important thing. As a matter of fact, we were talking uh, this morning mm -hmm. and uh, you had gone to one of our truly finest Jesuit high schools, uh, St. Ignatius in Cleveland, a really yeah. good school. Uh, friends of mine taught you, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, uh, Father Larry Ober and others, and you know it, it makes a big difference that the teachers understand and live Catholicism. Exactly. That's key, exactly. And it seems that this is what your goal is. Yeah, well, I, uh, just a, a quick story about that. I, uh, Mr. Hogan was one of my religion teachers at Ignatius, and I'll never forget, he came into class one day. This was sophomore morality, I think he was teaching, and he held up his wedding ring, and he said, this doesn't mean anything without God in my life. Uh, and as a young man, that struck me as always stayed with me this whole time because I realized mm -hmm. that the center of his life was Christ and his relationship with God, and that informed everything else. And so it was an inspiration for me to, to say, oh, that's, that's the standard that I have to try to follow. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's something that uh, most of us who have had a Catholic education, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it applies to uh, uh, the, the relationship between students and teachers in uh, non-Catholic schools, that teachers might say something in the course of a class might be even be a toss-off line, yeah. but you have no idea which student is going to be hit by that, mm -hmm. and it just sticks with you. Exactly. And those lines, even if they are off the cuff, need to come from a Catholic background in the teacher's life. Exactly. That So that what is just sort of coming out of the context that in one sense an interior catholic environment yes yes and what comes out of that like our lord said it's what comes out of the heart that matters exactly and that that will have an impact on students yeah so that i mean that's essentially what we try to do is to try to focus in on the teachers not not that every teacher has to be a theologian or an expert or a great apologist but to help them learn how to live their faith in prayer, to have regular prayer lives, so that by fostering the interior life, 
um, as they're teaching, and, and they're already good teachers, as they're teaching, what informs their teaching comes out of that interior relationship with the Trinity. Yeah. yeah. And what is it then that you actually do with the teachers? Yes, what, yeah. What, how do you accomplish this? It's a great goal. <laughs> what do you do? Right. Um, well, uh, one of the things that we've done, uh, which I think is, has been, in a sense, the, the game changer for us, is that we don't just have like one retreat. Like I was reading an article about Catholic identity and education, and, and the principal was a very good article and well-intentioned, said, well, we have a retreat every year about Catholic identity, and that's it. Um, we meet with the teachers six times throughout the year, and every time we meet with them, we meet with them for three hours. Uh, it's an hour and a half of... Uh, we present content, whether it's the catechism or scripture. Uh, we uh, foster large group, small group discussion. And then in the second hour and a half, we provide them a Bible study we wrote, uh, and they meet with each other, and they share their faith with each other mm -hmm. in the context of Bible study. Mm -hmm. um, so that over a year, along with the retreat, we provide 24 hours of faith formation for the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something mandated by the Archbishop. And as I said, the fruit has been clear uh, and it's been uh, really exemplary from, from my own experience in ministry. And, and when you talk about the fruit, what are some elements of that fruit that you notice? What is it you can, if, if anything, kind of detect yeah. that's bearing fruit? Yeah. Um, well, I have some statistics and I also have stories. So the, in terms of the stats, so two years ago, uh, we did a survey of the teachers um, there are about 70 Catholic schools in the Archdiocese of Omaha, which is a, a lot. Um, it is. And, um, uh, and, and that's in a, a, a city or, or county of how many? Um, of people? Catholics, about 230,000 Catholics. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's significant. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's significant. Um, and we have a lot of rural schools who are doing incredible work out there yes. as well, as well as in the, the, the Omaha itself. Mm -hmm. um, we, we serve about 985 of the teachers, of the 1,200 or so teachers in the Archdiocese. Uh, and um, uh, so we did this survey. Uh, we asked them three basic questions. Do you pray? Uh, have our sessions with you helped you learn your faith? And have our sessions with you helped you in your own personal prayer life? Uh, and in terms of learning the faith, 91% of the teachers said they learn more about their faith thanks to our sessions. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to prayer... 2% say they seldom pray. 10% uh, said they pray when they need to. 15% said they pray weekly. And 73% said they pray daily, right. which is good. There's still work to do, but, yes. but that's good. That, that's, that's very good. And, yeah. and by the way, add in there, you know, I taught high school for five years, yes. and you know, I didn't always find it very easy. Mm -hmm. You know, discipline and things like that were not didn't come easily to me. But one of the things that I would do is I'd be there before class, and I would pray for the students, mm. especially the most difficult ones. Yes, you know, and just pray at their desk, but the desk being empty, you know, it was empty, but just think about that child and, and pray for him. Mm, uh, you know, that's, that's a very important thing that you, because it, it, what you do with the kids is really still conversion that only God's grace does. Amen. So exactly. you need that. Exactly. So the, the statistics seem to suggest that we're helping them, and not just in knowledge of the faith, but also their prayer life. So of the 73% that say they pray daily, all 73% of them say that our sessions have helped them in their personal prayer life to come closer to Jesus, to understand the relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the statistics. In terms of stories, we've had teachers who've come back to the practice of the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers haven't gone to confession in years uh, after hearing our lectures on confession, coming back to confession. We've had teachers convert to the Catholic faith. Just this year, and we're only halfway through the academic year, we've had five different stories of teachers uh, entering into RCIA mm -hmm. to come into the Catholic faith. Well, yeah. one of the other questions I have is, um, you know, we hear about a lot of problems going on in the public school mm -hmm. system. Yeah. There is a... Uh, decline in knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, students don't know as much math, grammar, history, science. Mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, they, they, they don't know, or civics. Or so, yeah, civics, more civics has yeah. really suffered mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think we have to be cautious here. You know, a lot of people want to say, well, it's the, the teachers. There may be some of that. Sometimes there are ideological, you know, approaches uh, in the material the teachers are given. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they want that ideology. True. That's true. But another key factor is the, what I said at the beginning of the show. Parents may not even be there. Mm -hmm. And the, the lack of the parental involvement in the public school system, for the students who go to the public school system, yeah. is a big issue. Do, do those problems that we see going on in the public school system make people want to, or, or at least find Catholic schools more attractive? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, our experience in the Archdiocese has been, especially during COVID, we, have a, we had a large group of people coming to the Catholic schools. Uh, we, I know our, so many, many of our principals are trying to be careful about that because um, well, they have a culture they want to maintain and they don't want to just allow anybody to come in. They want families who are dedicated to the Catholic identity as well as their teachers. Mm -hmm. But we have seen many public school teachers leaving the public school system. So in, it's not just the students? No, 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 no. We've seen many public school teachers leaving because they, f they feel, as you said, it's not the teachers themselves, they feel like they're being um, restricted so much in being able just to share their own faith, uh, to, to view the world as they want to view it, because those, those changes are coming from the top down and are restricting their, their understanding of the human person or on human sexuality or any number of various things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So those public school teachers who are entering our Catholic schools, when they start to experience them, the classes that we teach with the teachers, um, those are the ones who are, who are coming back to their faith. Or I'll tell you just a quick story. There was a teacher last year, a uh, public school teacher who had gone through the, one of their sessions uh, and then was in the Bible study afterwards. Uh, and the study was on Our Lady. We were studying the Gospel of St. Luke. Mm -hmm. And after the study was over, she was just weeping. Uh, and the principal came over to her and said, you know, what's wrong? And she just said, I'm just so happy to be able to talk about the faith of my colleagues. Um, has never had that before. Yeah. Um, so that principal then shared that with us. And, and th those are the kinds of stories, and there's many <laughs> other I could tell, um, that we're seeing in, in the Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. mm -hmm. So this is something that is, a f y your, your goal is to affect the teachers, mm -hmm. this is what, what you mainly focus yeah. on, yeah. with an, an eye toward making sure the students have their Catholic identity and education made stronger. But it has a positive effect on the teachers as well. Right. So this is the interesting. So we don't tell the teachers what to teach in the classroom. Sometimes we'll get the, the request or the complaint, like, what are you giving us that we can take back to the classroom? And what the archbishop wants and what the, the superintendent wants, what we want is, this is for you and your personal prayer life. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that, again, if you transform the interior life and that relationship with Christ is strong, mm -hmm. that will bleed into the classroom anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so that the examples you use or your own personal example will be examples of the students. Um, which is not to say we don't give them things they can use every once in a while with their students, but the main goal is to help the teachers. You know? mm -hmm. And then with the teachers, transformed, they, again, have something more to give the students. Precisely, yeah. yeah. Um, St. Jean-Baptiste de La Salle, uh, the founder of the Christian Brothers, uh, he lives in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Mm -hmm. uh, he starts to train lay people to be teachers in, in France. And so he, he wrote a, a lot of meditations, a re retreat for these lay teachers in Catholic schools. And part of his argument is if God wants all people to be in relationship with him, which he does, right, and so wants to communicate truth to them, he's going to do so through the church, and the church provides these schools through these teachers. And then he says this. He says, Catholic school teachers are like guardian angels. Right? They protect and they guide students, protect them from bad ideas, false ideas, and they guide them in the faith so that the students can therefore lead a better life. That has to be in collaboration with the parents, as you were saying before. But, but that's their role. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, 
I know a lot of parents out there who sent their children to Catholic schools mm -hmm. and had them come out, not only not going to church, mm -hmm. but larger, some numbers of them don't believe in God, um, don't want to follow the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just Catholicism, it's, you know, God's basic moral teaching and faith in Jesus and all of this. And one of the things that I sense mm -hmm. was a problem that developed in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. is often enough, teachers wanted their uh, students to know about all the different options. So they would have a religion class, say in senior year high school or something, where they study Buddhism mm -hmm. and Islam and Hinduism and you know, Jainism, Zen, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would go through all that, but they didn't give them Catholicism. <laughs> right, right. And, and a lot of times they just had this, you know, uh, uh, approach. Uh, and I, I, th I think it's important what you're doing. You said, let's give the basic faith. Mm -hmm. This is the starting point of a Catholic school. Precisely, yeah. Yeah, the, but you mentioned Vatican II before. So uh, in the document on education of Vatican II, it, it says that the, the Catholic school's education is an extension of the apostle of the church, which is the conversion of the world, right? Evangelization. So if you're not teaching the faith, right, in a Catholic school, and what's more, if, if you're being an obstacle to the faith that the parents are trying to teach, then you're not living up to that identity. But see, that's, that's key, what mm. you said, because mm. uh, a lot of people don't, including some teachers, <laughs> even some clergy, <laughs> and even some religious nuns, don't know that document from Vatican II. Yeah. Yeah. And that education is meant to convert people to Christ. Precisely, yeah. To give, uh, John Paul II had the phrase of forming people in Christ, right? That, mm -hmm. That's what education is for, forming people in Christ. So you have to be able to give them Christ. And if you don't know who Christ is, how are you going to pass him on? Yeah, 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 yeah you, exactly. The old Latin uh, expression, nemo dat quad non habit. You can't give what you don't yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is, this is uh, key. Um, and I think to uh, encourage, uh, well, I, I know your archbishop. He, I remember him when he was uh, still living in Illinois. Ah, yes, of course. He was the Bishop of Springfield. Yeah. Uh, he's a fine, fine bishop. Yes. And, um, you know, he, you know to, to push this sense from the top mm -hmm. is well worth doing. He's, he, I, it sounds like he's making a, 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 an exemplary move that, mm -hmm. uh, after the 70s and 80s, he's showing it can be done and it has a good effect. Yes. Yeah, so uh, he, I'm sure I can hear him kind of saying he would want to emphasize that he's responding to the desire of parents, right, um, who want this for their children in their Catholic schools. Uh, and the example of his brother bishops as well, who are doing maybe similar things in their dioceses. But, but he understands because he has... Uh, uh, such a great appreciation for the education he received from his parents, the example he received from his parents, he really gets the importance of having a structure that supports parents who want to do the right things by their, their children and who want to send them to the Catholic schools so that they can maintain the faith going forward. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. See, and, and again, this is something that would be uh, another kind of issue. Mm. I can certainly, uh, I'm aware of some parents who would send their students to a Catholic school, not because they want the faith, but they want a good college prep program. Right. What do you say to that? Well, they're welcome, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that, and I think we do this pretty well in the Archdiocese, uh, is that this is a Catholic school. Uh, and so your student, even if they're not particularly Catholic, even if not you're particularly interested in it, uh, they're gonna have to participate as, as they're allowed with the Catholic faith and still take the, the, the religion courses and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we're respectful, obviously, of, of those from different faiths, 
Um, but as we've said, this is about evangelizing people in the faith and bringing them Christ and forming them in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we've, we've done pretty well in the Archdiocese in, in bringing those people in, making them feel welcome, but also challenging them a bit too. Yeah. yeah. And I don't, uh, in many ways, in the history of the Society of Jesus, uh, where we started lots of schools, mm -hmm. and our schools uh, back in the 15 and 1600s tended to be the best schools in a country. Mm -hmm. And people sent their sons to our schools for that good education, but the Jesuits always had that aspect that our goal is to win them to Christ. Mm -hmm. That's that, again, Vatican II is very clear on this. Exactly. Um, and we want to see more teachers have the same mentality. Teach science extremely well. Yes. Teach them great mathematics. Yes. Make them geniuses. Yes. But let them know that math is a spiritual science. Yes. And let them help help them to find God in science and, and, and mathematics. Yeah, the great gift we have in our intellectual tradition is the understanding and the faith and the knowledge that the good, the true, and the beautiful is God, right? God is truth. He is beauty. beauty. So um, we don't have to fear holding back on any of the, the, the academic excellence that is so much a tradition of the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. We can present that and at the same time, presented in the context of the faith, and those two things aren't in tension with each other at all. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that, as various studies have been done, the Keras, there was a CARA study back in 2016 um, that, that said that students are leaving in part because they don't see that connection. The young people leave the practice of the faith because they don't think there's a connection between faith and reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, again, a big theme that Pope St. John Paul yes. taught in his encyclical on yeah. faith and reason, mm -hmm. Fides et Ratio, a big issue for Pope Benedict. Yes. Um, you know, these things uh, of seeing the unity of faith and knowledge, that knowledge is one mm -hmm. and has its source in God, but helping people connect the dots yes. is what a teacher does. Precisely. So I'll tell you a story. There, there, was, a, there was a young uh, male teacher at elementary school and um, I, I always kind of thought he wasn't paying attention <laughs> when I was d doing the, the sessions. Um, but by year two or three, he would come up after and he would ask me some pretty pointed questions about church teaching on this women priest or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then by year four, he got to be pretty friendly and asking questions during the class. Um, and at the end of that year, he came up to me and he said, hey, I just want to let you know, uh, I'm finishing out this year. I'm going to be teaching at another school. I was going to teach at a public school, he said, but I wanted to teach at a, at a Catholic school because I've learned how important my faith is. And then this is what he said. He said, um, w and he was a science teacher, um, your sessions helped me understand that the, that the faith is reasonable. Yes. Um, and it, it was a, the rational presentation of the faith that built the trust that he needed to investigate more and to delve into the rest of the practice of the faith. Mm -hmm. So it's that connection for so many that is missing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think that's exactly right. Yeah. That's why a lot of young people describe themselves as nuns. Right, yes, exactly because right. Because they can't see the connection. Precisely right, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not that they have bad will. No. Yeah. It uh, maybe some. But <laughs> yeah, no doubt some do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, it's it's more that you know they uh the, the, you, you have to help connect the dots. Yes, exactly. You know you give them the dots of information, mm -hmm. but true education is leading them to make the connections and, and make sense out of life. Yeah. And, and that's a goal of conversion. Something else though, um, you know, I also went to Catholic uh, school, uh, Catholic grammar school for six years, and then uh, Catholic high school, mm -hmm. uh, high school seminary. And something that was warp and woof mm. of our experience is that the school prayed. We did Stations of the Cross. Mm -hmm. We 
went to confession once a month uh, as a class. Mm. Um, lots of things, mm. you know, like that. Um, mass was, was no, in fact, it was called the school mass. Does that also flow out of this program, that encouraging the teachers to introduce Catholic practice into the school day? Yeah, so uh, we have these sessions sometimes on, on things you can do with the students, prayers you can have with the students, mm -hmm. um, ways to help them incorporate prayer. Now, uh, again, the Archives of Omaha, we're so blessed to have the teachers we do. So, a lot of them are already doing this in terms of, you know, there's a test coming up. Well, let's pray together for the test. Mm -hmm. um, uh, prayer has an effect. I mean, you can study, right? But it, there's still grace, right? right? Grace works on nature. So, but let's, let's not forget about the grace part. Too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that has been an effect in the way our schools have become intentional about wanting to make sure that not just their teachers, but their students and the school culture is one that uh, advocates for and, and furthers devotion. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's, I think that's also an important part. That's just should be normal. Absolutely. Uh, now, I don't know if this is relevant because most, I guess, most of the teachers in your program are in the Catholic uh, grammar school or elementary school? The vast majority, yeah. 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 We have uh, several some high, high schools. schools. Yeah, we have 17 high schools total in the Archdiocese. Okay. Many of them are run by religious orders, and we don't work with the religious orders, but the they Archdiocesan ones, yeah, the Archdiocesan ones we, we do, yeah. Okay. Yeah. My question would be this. Uh, does this program also apply to administrators? <laughs> you know, because that's a different kind of service in yeah, the school. Very true. The teacher has this relationship with the students, but the administration has a different that relationship with the with the students. Yeah. Um, and sometimes not always so positive, <laughs> depending <laughs> right. on the student. depending on the student. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Because right. we were, to, I remember the first day we went to Catholic school going to uh, Sister Sean's office, she was the principal, <laughs> as well as the Mother Superior. Mm. This was not something you ever, <laughs> right. ever wanted to do. So, um, so it's a different relationship. <laughs> Does this program apply to them too? Well, they're not required to be there, but I'm happy to say that most are there during our sessions. Um, they sit through the sessions, if for no other reason, just to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but we do have principals who get a lot out of it, who are, they're taking notes, they're participating in, in the sessions because they learn things that they want to know because they want to be better. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it would seem to me that the school administrators who have, a, a, in many ways, as much a ministry to the students as they do to the parents. Yes. Because they're interacting with end. them because yes. of finances, discipline, all those uh, issues. Um, and I guess that would be an aspect for them as well. Yeah, they, so one of the things that they have found helpful for us is because sometimes we've done this for them is to um, uh, provide them with language. Sometimes, you know, they might not know the specifically how to articulate some aspect of the Catholic faith, but provide them with language about how to do so. So I remember one principal, for instance, there was a, um, a kerfuffle in the school around some hot button issue. And so she came to me and said, how do I broach this subject with the parents on both sides in a way that honors the Catholic Church's teaching? And so, so I was able to help her out in that. Sure. Yeah, so, yeah. So. I think that's uh, also a very important part. I know um, in, in my order, and I think in some of the other orders, uh, there are a lot of us that would like to be in the classroom and not in administration yeah. because you, you feel that your education in a certain field is to teaching yeah, to right. the students. Yeah, right. um, and administration is a very specific kind of call. Mm -hmm. um, I never had it. Uh, Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, and my my superiors never even suggested I be an administrator. I'm an organizational idiot. But this is uh, uh, something that also will have an impact on the, the 
the whole school. Yeah, it, it, we, we found that in those schools where the principal is totally supportive of the work we've done, it makes a difference in the way the teachers react. It makes a difference for the teachers to know the principal is there and feels that this time is important enough for the principal, who has already so much on their plate, uh, to be there and, and, uh, and to learn from us. And so where we get the full support of the principal is where we find uh, the most fruit. That's good. That's good. We're going to take a little break, but if you would like to find out more about Evangelium Institute, you can simply go to eicatholic.org, eicatholic.org, and find out more about what they do. And some of you who are administrators or teachers in other dioceses, might want to look to that and see how can we bring this to our diocese. You know, can we get your bishop to support you? We'll come back in just a couple of minutes with your questions and comments, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and he works with, he's the head of the Evangelium uh, Institute uh, in the Archdiocese of Omaha, Nebraska. And we've been talking about the preparation that they do for uh, the, the teachers uh, in the Catholic schools. Uh, so we have a comment here from our studio audience. I'd like to start off with that. Ma'am, where are you from? Um, I was born and raised in Lebanon. Yes. I lived for 18 years in Senegal, in Africa, uh -huh. and I've been in the United States since 1974. Wow. So teaching is in my blood, and I love to teach. And I say to all the teachers, whether they are Catholic school teachers or public school teachers, don't take, I mean, don't become a teacher just for the salary. If you don't have it in you, go find another job. But you, you were talking before about uh, when, when you uh, asked to, um, is to make a comment that your colleagues in the public school, did you teach in Senegal? I taught for a short time in Senegal. I'm talking, I'm mostly, talking about teaching here teaching in the United here. States. And your colleagues made some comments about yeah. the way you teach. Exactly. What, what, tell us about that. I mean, being a, uh, being a, a pub public school teachers, you're not allowed. I mean, we don't teach religion. But the way that we operate, the way that we treat students, the, the way that we treat parents, it shows where you come from. It shows the kind of faith and spirituality that you were raised with. Yes. Yeah. And I do believe that whether it's a public school or Catholic school, the teachers can't do everything. I no. believe in the fact that the seed of faith should be planted at home at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if the, student, if the kids go to public school, that's where that seed grows and be nurtured by all the education, by all the religious education that's offered to them. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I don't care what subject we're talking about. Teachers alone can do the job. If we don't have the support of the parents, we can't go anywhere. I think, I think that's key. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a key for every subject, yes. not just religion. No, no. You know, the, um, uh, one of the number one factors in children becoming A and B students is that their father helps them with their homework. <laughs> That's, uh, and, you know, 
I don't, they, they, they didn't ask why. They, I haven't seen any studies on why the father has that bigger impact. Mm -hmm. But the studies have been consistent yeah. is that when mom helps, that's good. But when dad helps, it makes an even bigger impact. Yeah. And I, I just have a hunch uh, about that, that mom is in charge of the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know what you know what, what goes on in the home. Mom is in charge. Dad is this bridge to the outside world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if he thinks that something in the outside world is important, you know, well, I don't like it, but yeah, yeah, it probably is important. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's one of those <laughs> right. things like that. Because uh, the same factors show up about kids going to church. Yes. If dad goes to church the kids are more likely to go to church when they become adults, yeah. not mom. That, mm. That's not her realm of influence. It's seen statistically. Right. Yeah, there was a study that came out, or a survey really in 2021, that talked about the, uh, to, to your point about this, this question of the influence in the home, and uh, they, they showed that uh, families where they said grace before meals, that those children ended up practicing the faith um, uh, more in later life. Now, it wasn't necessarily the saying grace at meals, right? It was that saying grace at meals is a, is a marker for a family that allows their faith to permeate the rest of their week, right? right? The rest of their lives. Right. So that when the family and the home uh, makes the effort as a whole, that the faith is going to affect them and their identity as Catholics in the home, it's more likely that the children remain, remain Catholic going forward. So, so where the schools then come in is in supporting the parents, providing them with resources, obviously not undermining those efforts, um, and then continuing that, that um, idea of allowing the faith to influence the entire world uh, in math, science, English, not just religion. Yeah, uh, again, I remember in Catholic school, we had Catholic readers. Yep. The mm -hmm. stories were oftentimes about Catholic like things, yeah. <laughs> things, Catholic people. <laughs> right, yeah. And we had a Catholic history book that included the influence of Catholics on American history and mm -hmm. world history. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's just just like you would have uh, today in schools, uh, histories that include a lot more about African Americans than they used to. Exactly. That makes an impact yeah, on African American so. exactly. students Precisely. for the good. Amen. Amen. And the same thing is true with a Catholic history book showing the influence of the church. I, we invented the universe. And, yes, yeah, right. You know, and the hospital. I mean, there are lots of things that are part of history that we yeah. should do. And it's important to have all that. But, you know, our, our guest's point about the family mm -hmm. is crucial. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, you know, in that realm, um, you know, I, I, th I think... Uh, the, uh, another aspect of making the Catholic environment something uh, I know that lady she's been she's visiting here in Birmingham her family uh, but she's come to our parish which is a Lebanese parish yeah. and in Catholic culture the family evangelizes through various holiday food <laughs> yes, I thought that's what you were going with. That. Yeah, that's right. So, yes. l like last Friday uh, night and Saturday, we celebrated Epiphany because mm -hmm. we celebrate on the sixth. Mm -hmm. And so, and for Epiphany, you make slebe, which is a, a, a fried dough kind of cake. Mm. Uh, it's not exactly a donut. It's different. It's not like a churro. It's a bit different. <laughs> uh, it's Lebanese, in Middle Eastern, because <laughs> the Palestinians make them. And, oh, okay. Well, and it's things like that that are cultural, but it's family evangelization. Yeah. These, did, did that kind of thing also get presented in the schools? 
Yeah, uh, that's not our focus as much, but uh, we have talked in the past about the, the way that families can help with the kind of regular prayer life or with the liturgy. We've talked about the liturgy and the, that ebb and flow and the rhythm of the liturgy, which mm -hmm. reflects a little bit of that kind of family yeah. um, uh, ebb and flow. You have the, the specific meals you serve. I'm thinking about my wife's Canadian and her mom's from uh, Eastern Canada, and so there's specific things we serve at Christmas time and, and other right. things. So, like those things that are part of the rhythm of family are part of the liturgy of the church too, kind of the rhythm of yes. the family of the church. And so we do teach about that aspect of the faith. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and, and I think you know, encouraging that in our Catholic school mm. cultures mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is even, and, and they are diverse. Oh yeah. You know, so you know, there'll be uh, a variety of uh, traditions, but I don't mind sharing. <laughs> right. Well, one of the blessings we have in, in Omaha is we receive refugees from many parts of the world uh, who are fleeing violence of various kinds. And so we have, in some cases, uh, Catholics or Christians and sometimes Muslims from other parts of the world who fled and are in Omaha and then come into our Catholic schools and bring their traditions uh, and their rhythms, uh, and then we can see how those things tie into the faith. Yeah, yeah I, I, th these are uh, important parts of the family. I always have thought of, you know, for instance, at Easter t time in uh, Lebanese and Middle Eastern uh, communities, they'll make these cookies, mm -hmm. ma'mul, that are meant to be uh, uh, in the shape of the tomb of Christ. Oh, yes. And, you know, and inside, you know, instead of Christ, there's, you know, uh, sweet nuts or sweet um, uh, date and things like that. And it's just teaching, you know, the faith at every aspect. And again, this is, it's this kind of thing that is part of a Catholic environment. Yeah, well, we, we've been around for so long, right? And there's so many traditions and so many different ethnicities um, to try to bring those things into the faith, especially these days when so many people are maybe just more aware of the fact that there are other ethnicities, other cultures, yeah. and, other, and other foods, right? Uh, right. And so it's a, a great way to be able to introduce the faith uh, within the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so, because um, as I've often thought, you know, we had Polish ones when I was growing up, and these are the way moms evangelized and catechized their children. <laughs> these are a good thing. Yeah. Uh, the the, the, the sub mutual support of the family and the school yes. in the faith yes. with these with all kinds of teaching tools is a very important part of it. Amen. In terms of uh, uh, another area that uh, I've wondered about, uh, what kind of literature do you encourage the teachers to give the students? You know, uh, sometimes I've heard complaints from parents that there's not enough content mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the classes, you know, that they want their students to learn more. Yeah. Um, what what kind of things do you encourage the teachers to bring for instruction? Yeah. Well, we um, uh, our job is not to provide a curriculum, but we have shown the teachers. There was a, again another survey that came out relatively recently um, that talked about the influences on uh, now adults and why they continue to practice. So what were your biggest influences? Mm -hmm. You go to mass regularly, so what's kept you Catholic? Um, and obviously mother and father right up there. Yep. Uh, priest was actually very, very high, mm -hmm. uh, the influence of a good priest in their life. Um, but also very high was books. You know what wasn't high? The internet. <laughs> the internet ah. wasn't high. <laughs> um, but books, Catholic yeah, books. Yeah, were you interviewing high. old people? Yeah. <laughs> no, they had a range. Oh, they had okay. a range. Right, yeah. right. I asked that question. Yeah. So the uh, when Catholic books were important, and so exposing our young people to good literature, even if it's not you know Catholic necessarily, but you know Joseph Pierce does so well with his series on on explicating how you can look at a a piece of secular literature from a Catholic viewpoint. Yes. Um, Doing that sort of thing uh, is very helpful to help the imagination 
um, uh, turn to, to the faith. So we, uh, I've told the story of um, Dr. Ordway. She's a convert to the faith from atheism. She came to the faith because of her love of literature and because she, she had a Catholic imagination, even though she didn't know it. Uh, she had a Catholic imagination so that when she finally met a Christian, she was open to the possibility of Christianity, it eventually led her to the Catholic faith. I, I would point out to folks that we recently saw in the news that uh, a school board uh, chairman or whatever the leader of the school board was called uh, took his oath of office on a stack of pornographic books. Oh. Um, that had been banned from the library by the governor of Virginia, mm. uh, that the Commonwealth doesn't want those books in there. So he took his own. I think that points out the contrast. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That having good Catholic books and literature versus things that are oriented towards robbing the students of their innocence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, will make them more adult. They're not adults. Yeah, right. You know, this is not right. Right. Uh, and maybe manipulative. <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't know his intention, but um, we have another approach. Yes. That, uh, you know, we don't swear lightly, for one thing, mm -hmm. as our Lord teaches, mm -hmm. but also... Um, we want to let the students be familiar with a rich literature that's going to, not just something that they might say, well, it's popular now. We want them to have good literature. Yeah, so uh, this reminds me of um, uh, my background, uh, my background in theology and specifically with the Church of Social Teaching. So uh, I, I write about and I, I teach and I give talks on the Church of Social Teaching and the the kind of um, ideological, you mentioned the ideological movements in education these days, is coming out of a kind of, the, the, it's called critical theory, you know, this idea yes. of an us versus them. Yes. They reject, right, objective truth. Right? There's no such thing as objective truth. So the way they determine what's right and wrong is by looking at disparities in power or socioeconomic standing, et cetera. This, this ideology then that starts in the universities and trickles down to the public schools, et cetera, um, it creates that kind of, I'm gonna show them and I'm gonna put my hand on these banned books because I'm gonna fight the power. And, and they, the, their purpose is to, to indoctrinate because that's the way you bring about what they call social justice. Even though that's a Catholic idea, um, uh, even though social justice is a Catholic thing, it's in our teachings, um, but they've twisted it to be something else. Yeah, it, it's it's not exactly what we would call justice. No, right, exactly. It's neither social or justice. Right? No, <laughs> right. no, no, yeah, yeah. no. It would be, uh, they would, uh, in fact, be happy. I sense that there are a lot of people who are more happy with the idea of undermining society to knock everything down. Yes, yes. And then... I'll rebuild yes. a better system. That's precisely the idea. That's yeah. precisely the yeah. idea. And as you were saying, we have a different approach, right? Yeah. Um, we are not grounded on the oppositionist mentality. It's not an us versus them. Christ didn't say that at the Last Supper. He said, love one another. So yes. with that, that central teaching of love based on truth, he is the way, the truth, and life, um, we can therefore, I think, we're better suited than for education, right? Um, because we're passing on truth and love. And, and I think it's well worth noting um, that, you know, the large bulk of the present Catholic population are descendants of people who immigrated to this country mm -hmm. between about 1880 and 1921. Mm -hmm. they, the government became afraid of too much immigration and that you couldn't integrate, mm -hmm. couldn't make them American enough. Right. But the folks that came in that period tended to be illiterate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they, they, they didn't go to school. They were peasants and proletariat and working people. <laughs> and they started the Catholic school system. 
And by 1960, with less than 100 years, Catholics became the second best educated and second wealthiest religious group in the country. Mm -hmm. Only the Jews who came over at the same time yeah, yeah. and were also committed to their own good school system. Exactly. They're slightly ahead of us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in education and wealth, mm -hmm. but um, the two of us really succeeded because of education. But we succeeded because the education in both cases was religious. Precisely, yeah. So, so that the, talking about um, uh, if you want to change society, right? You, you talked about tearing everything down and rebuilding it. If you want to change society for the good, if you want to achieve authentic social justice, then things like Catholic education are key. Mm -hmm. um, and and that was the motivation of a lot of the the, the Jesuits and the Christian brothers, etc., to provide education to the poor of Europe. Yeah. so that they could advance. Yes. And that's what so many missionaries do today in India and Africa and Pakistan and so many other places by providing good education for those so that they can, ad they can gain wealth and they can, they can come out of poverty. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I, part of me you know, has a, a, a thought lurking in the back of my mind mm -hmm. that some of the dumbing down of students, some of it, as well as the anti-Catholic education and anti-religious education. Religious, yeah. it, it's not only anti-Catholic, the, the largest religious system, but it's against the Jewish school systems and the Protestant mm -hmm. uh, evangelical school mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. That part of that is, I think there are a lot of people that don't want people to advance yeah. and do well. And what your institute does is help to ensure a strong Catholic identity that makes it possible for the advancement of the students to go forward. Precisely. Would that be fair? Oh, absolutely. Uh, regardless of their background, regardless of their economic or, or even religious background, as I right. said before, we have so many refugees from so many other places. Um, to, to give them the tools so that they can advance and be contributors to society, which we talked about civics before, right? Um, uh, to contribute to the common good requires you have a certain base level of education, knowledge of good and, of good and evil, and a certain building up of virtue, too. And so we encourage the schools to focus in on virtue and, and virtue development. Yeah. Like virtues like justice. Amen. You exactly. know, these, this, what is the proper understanding of justice? Along with prudence. Yes, yes. You know, yeah. these, these are good virtues. Exactly. You know, we want to have courage. Amen. You know, that's the stories that we, we teach, stories about courage mm -hmm. and not cowardice. Mm -hmm. It boggles my mind sometimes when I keep hearing the politicians uh, saying, I'm really scared of the opposition. Well, if you're that scared, get out of politics. We don't need <laughs> right. cowards yeah, right. to be our leaders. That's you right. should be strong Fortitude. and courageous. This yeah. is, these are virtues Amen. that we want to teach. And... Be, being more Catholic in our schools will be the way to do that, is my sense. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, I want to encourage you know, our folks in the audience to learn more about the Evangelium Institute. You can go to eicatholic.org, eicatholic.org. Also, if you want to find out more about the work that Deacon Omar Gutierrez is doing, uh, just simply go to omargutierrez.com, omargutierrez.com, and they can find out some of the other projects that you have going on, I take it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and, uh, uh, and again, I, I would hope that one of the things you all get from this program is that in other cities, you think about how can we do this in our diocese. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure that your institute would help them Absolutely. get some ideas. Absolutely, we would. Yeah. Well, Deacon, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Uh, I hope that uh, it was a little bit warmer than Omaha. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, glad to have you down here in uh, Sweet Home, Alabama. And may the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May the Lord lead you in all of your ways by His peace. 
May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And as I've said many times, Mother Angelica was inspired to have this network brought to you by you and not by advertisers. So we again do as we always do, remind you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you. <laughs>